Let's turn over to Mark chapter 4. Is there anybody here that this is your first time you've been here in the five services we've held? Could I see your hand? Those of you, this is your first time? Praise God. Well, welcome. It's amazing. We've had a lot of people come through here this week, if you take um, all the different ones that have been here. And uh, what I started teaching on was out of Ephesians chapter 4. And basically, I've spent the whole weekend just talking about that you've got to quit thinking the way you thought before you got born again. It says in Ephesians 4, 17, don't think as the Gentiles. That's talking about the lost people. When you get born again, it's more than just getting your your uh, eternal salvation taken care of, but you become a new person in the spirit. Your spirit is perfect. If you get my teaching on spirit, soul, and body, that's what it'll talk about, that you've already got everything in your spirit. You're already healed. You're already blessed. But you didn't get a new brain. You have to change the way you think. In Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 1 and 2, talk about be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we took those scriptures from Ephesians 4, 17. Then I went to Ephesians 4, 18 that says that if you don't begin to think differently, then your understanding becomes darkened. You are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's within you. Man, those are major, major statements. I spent all Friday morning talking about that. Then I went over to Genesis chapter 3 and talked about this is how Satan came against Adam and Eve is with words. He came against their thoughts and he got them to think contrary to what God said. The moment you think contrary to God's word, you are going to sin. You are going to fail. You are going to have problems. And so I spent a lot of time talking about that. And this morning I... uh, got off and basically spent most of the morning talking about Second Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, that everything that pertains unto life and godliness comes through the knowledge of Him. We've got to renew our minds. And this is where so many people are missing it. They're wanting different results, but they aren't going to change the way they think. It's insane to think that you're going to get different results with thinking the same way that you thought before. Proverbs 23, 7, as as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is going the direction of your dominant thought. If you want different results, don't just pray for different results. Don't hope for it. Don't ask somebody else to somehow or another change you and, and, um, you know, uh, give away your authority to somebody else just hoping that they can make things different. It's as simple as changing the way you think. If if you change the way you think, your uh, circumstances, your situations will change. That's what I've been talking about. And here in Mark chapter 4 are some of the most profound scriptures that the Lord ever spoke to me about this. And normally I would teach at least three to four sessions on the parable of the sower sowing the seed. I would preach two or three sessions on the parable in Mark chapter 4, verse 26. And then I'd preach another session on Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And I'm going to try and preach them all tonight. So this ought to be exciting. So let me just say that I'm not going to go into the same depth that I normally go into. I encourage you to get there. I've got a teaching entitled, uh, what is that title? <laughs> a Sure Foundation that would cover a lot of these things. And then I've got a teaching entitled The Sower Sows the Seed that would cover this. I've got a teaching that is uh, Faith Builders that would cover some of these. So I've got a lot of teaching that covers this. And if you get spoken to by the Lord tonight, I encourage you to get those other things and go into this more. You know, there's just, there's such a wealth of material on how important the Word of God is in renewing your mind that I can't cover it in five sessions. I just couldn't cover it if we spent weeks and weeks here. This is the word of God says this so many different ways, but these are some of the most important things that God has spoken to me. So I want to at least attempt to cover some of these things in the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. In the first part, the Lord gave a parable about a man who went out and sowed seed and they didn't sow seed the way we do today, where you dig a furrow and then you space your seed out. This is talking about a man who just had a bag full of seed and he went out and just threw it. He scattered seed everywhere and this seed landed on four different types of ground. And there was a ground that was very hard packed. It was like a path 
and it couldn't penetrate the ground and the fowls of the air immediately came and ate that seed. Then the second type of ground was a ground where it did penetrate, but there was, it was so many rocks that it didn't have any root. And so it didn't last and it, and it didn't bring forth any fruit. The third type of ground was a type of ground where there was a lot of thorns and weeds and the weeds choked it and sapped the nourishment from the seed. So it didn't bring forth any fruit to perfection. And then the fourth type of ground was a type of ground that brought forth 30, 60, and a hundred fold. And the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, says, why are you teaching in parables? They were sharp enough to know that he wasn't really teaching about how to be a farmer. There was a spiritual application to what he was saying. And he says, why don't you just tell the people what you're saying? And anyway, I'm going to skip this because I could spend a lot of time on this, but there was a reason that he did that. The things of God aren't hidden from his people. They're hidden for his people. And with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will take things and reveal it to you. And God did this so that you will know things that non-believers can't know. The Holy Spirit will explain it. You know, when people come up to me, I bet you I had four or five people tonight who asked me a question and I said, I can't give you the answer to that question. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. Pray in tongues. Let the Holy Spirit tell you what to do. Man, the Holy Spirit will explain things to you if you will allow him. So anyway, one thing I want to point out before we get right into this parable is in verse 13. This is the last thing he said to his disciples in response to why are you teaching these things in parables? And he said unto them, know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? What this is saying is if you don't understand this parable of the sower sowing the seed, you won't understand any parable. This is a key to understanding the teachings of Jesus. In other words, this is a foundational truth. This is one of the most important things. If you can get the truths that were in this parable of the sower sowing the seed, it'll open up everything else that Jesus taught to you. Now that is significant. And so you've got to understand these principles. And then he began to give the interpretation of this parable in verse 14. He says, the sower sows the word. So this parable is really not about sowing seed. It's not about how to grow vegetables. It's about how the Word of God works. And if you were to take this, you don't always get this if you just read Matthew and then Mark, Luke, and John. But if you were to take like my living Bible, comment, my, uh, what do we call that? Life for Today Bible Commentary and look at it. I've got the four Gospels arranged chronologically so that you have everything side by side And if you look at it that way, there are actually 13 parables that Jesus taught in one day. And this is just one of those 13 parables. And this is the most teaching from Jesus we have in one day of any place in scripture. And every one of those parables was about a seed, about the word, how the word works. So he was, he just taught them over and over and over all day long about how the kingdom works And every one of these parables was about how that the word of God is to the kingdom of God, the way that a seed is to this natural world. Now that is profound. I could preach on that for an hour. Some of you doubt that I could do it, but you can ask. (laughs) I can preach on this an hour. This is powerful. Did you know nothing in this universe, in this world that we know of operates without seed? Seed is how life exists. It's how this world exists. You wouldn't eat if there weren't seeds. Everything that you eat, fruit, anything, it comes from seed. Animals come from seed. People come from seeds. You are a product of a seed. Without a seed, there is no life. The whole world operates off of seeds. There isn't life. There is nothing that is outside of seeds. And this is significant because, see, he used a natural law that he created. If he would have said, the kingdom of God is like going to school. Did you know that's not a good comparison because you can cheat in school. You can cram for a test. Probably every person in here has done that where you didn't really pay attention, but the night before your test, you stayed up all night long, you studied, you got this information in your short-term memory, and you passed the test, 
But today, five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, you don't have a clue what was on that test. You didn't learn it. You crammed for a test. You beat the system. You can, you can cheat in school. You can cram for a test. You can do that with any social man-made system. But you know what? You can't cram for a harvest. You can't cheat this system of seed, time, and harvest. There was a man in one of my Bible studies who was the worst sinner in all of Baca County in, California, in uh, Colorado. And this guy got born again and got so turned on, he started going on the full gospel businessman circuit and speaking, and he got so busy, he didn't have time to farm his land. But he was a faith man. He was supernatural. So he just waited until one week before wheat harvest, and he went out and borrowed $500,000 and planted $500,000 worth of wheat in about 15 sections. There is uh, 640 acres per section. He spent $500,000 on seed one week before wheat harvest because he was a faith man and he had been doing what God told him to do. So he just ignored the law of sowing seed time and harvest. And he thought God would give him a supernatural harvest in one week's time. And when his wheat didn't come up and the bank came after him and he didn't have any money, he came to me. Why did God do this? I said, God didn't do this. There's a time to plant and there's a time to reap and you missed it. And you can't cram for a harvest. You can't sow your seed and just pray over it and supernaturally reap harvest. In the natural, we all look at that and think, you know, that's silly. How dare a person do that? Every one of us in here has done this spiritually. To where we wait until the bankers are at our door, until the doctors told us we're going to die. And then we go and, oh, let's see, what's this scripture? And you go look up a scripture and you pray it real quick. And if you aren't healed within 24 hours, how come God didn't come through? There's seed, time, and harvest. And it's usually seed, time, and then harvest. You have to let the Word of God work. And the Word has to take root on the inside of you. And so this is why the Lord used a seed to illustrate how the Word of God works in our life. The Word of God is powerful. You know, I've got a rock on my property that's twice as tall as this ceiling called Indian Head Rock, and I've chiseled a, a seat on the top of it, and I sit on top of that and watch the rest of the world drive by. Amen. It's really awesome. But anyway, it's this huge chunk of granite. It's probably one-third the size of this room or a quarter the size of this room, and it's just a huge piece of granite. But this huge rock has little dips in it where there's a little, you know, uh, water will get caught in there and then dirt will blow into there. And so there gets to be a little bit of dirt and then a seed lands in there. And that huge boulder is split in two by a seed that landed there. I don't know how it got there. And it split this boulder that must be tons and tons, megatons. It, it little tiny seed split that huge boulder. I couldn't have split that boulder if I'd had a jackhammer. I don't know how it happens, but that's the power that's in a seed. The Word of God is powerful, but it has to come off of this page and get planted in your heart. The Word of God is the seed in the ground. These four different types of ground in this story are talking about the condition of people's hearts. Boy, this is important. I learned this early in my ministry that I'd preach my heart out and I thought if I was really putting out the word properly that everybody ought to be changed. Because I thought, man, the word of God is powerful and I'd see some people just get changed. I've seen people jump up and down on their seat before. They were so excited. They were getting it. They couldn't sit still and the person next to them falls asleep. And then the next person sitting like this and they don't believe a word that I say and after a while, my lightning fast mind figured out that, you know what, the same word coming out of my mouth can affect all of these people differently. And I began to realize it's not just the seed. It depends on what kind of ground it's planted in. It depends on the condition of your heart. And so the seed, it says in First 
Peter chapter 2, verse 23, or chapter 1, verse 23, it says that the, God's Word is an incorruptible seed that we are born by. God's Word never fails. It never rots. There is no bad seed from the Word. But the problem is there's bad ground. Not everybody's heart receives the Word and protects it. And so we don't ever have to worry about the seed, but we do have to consider the condition of our heart. So this tells us about four different types of people. And there, I believe that every person in here fits into one of these four categories. This is all inclusive. And I also believe that these are four stages. I don't think anybody just automatically becomes good ground. You start, everybody starts out in this first stage. And then you progress to the second stage, the third stage, and finally the fourth stage where you begin to start bearing fruit. You can't skip these things. You've got to work through all of these problems. And so the very first type of person in verse 15, it says, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, who when they have heard uh, immediately, or excuse me, when they have heard Satan cometh, immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So this first type of person is a person that the word never penetrated their understanding. It didn't get down in their heart. It just stayed on the surface and Satan had free access. Satan was only able to steal the word from one out of these four different types of people. And that's the person that was first represented. And I'm not going to take time. I'm trying to hurry through this. But if you compare this with Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, which is the exact same story over there, it says, these are those who understand not. And Satan comes immediately and steals the word out of their heart. So you put these together, you find that what happened was the person's understanding was darkened. Go back to the very first scriptures that I used on Thursday night. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, don't be as the Gentiles are like a lost man who walk in the vanity of their mind, verse 18, having the understanding darkened. If you don't begin to renew your mind by the Word of God and change your paradigm and way of thinking, then it just makes you spiritually dull to where the word never penetrates. It just doesn't make any sense to you. And Satan can steal it from a person like that. You have got to present the word of God in a way that it connects with a person. They understand it and it gets below the surface or Satan will have it before they're out the door. This is why we have children's church. You don't change what you're saying. You still teach the word, but you know what? You don't use the illustration about marriage or about going to work every day, or about, you know, old age and going into nursing homes. Four and five-year-olds don't relate to that. So you use illustrations that relate to them, and you present it in a way that they can understand the principles. You don't change the message, but you change the way it's presented. You know, when I'm speaking to people overseas that don't understand Americanisms and don't understand our culture, I don't use the same illustrations that I use here. You've got to present things in a way that people understand it. You use illustrations that they understand. You'd think that ought to be obvious, but it just amazes me how so many preachers today think that if they are really deep, that, it, that you ought to have to bring a dictionary with you to the church service and they use all of these $5 words that nobody understands and theological terms and they think that somehow or another this is smart. You know what I think is really good is when a person can talk on anybody's level. I don't care if you're an intellectual or an idiot. You can understand what they're saying. That's a good communicator. You've got to communicate in a way that people understand what you're saying. I can stand for people to reject what I'm saying, but I can't stand for them not to get what I'm saying. That's a reflection on me. If they don't like it, they can reject it, but they ought to at least understand my point. I'm blunt sometimes to the point of being brutal, but people do know what I'm trying to say. Amen. So anyway, the first type of person, you've got to get them to understand or Satan just steals it from them. Then in Mark chapter four and in verse 16, it says, and these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. 
I could spend hours on this passage because this is where Jamie and I were when the Lord first spoke this to me. We were in a situation where the Word was in our heart. We had understood it. We were trying to walk in it, but it hadn't become our revelation. We were preaching other people's revelation. And we just got so excited about it. Notice it says, this is, these are the types of people who they receive it with gladness. Man, we were excited and we were out quoting and we would quote this person. This person said this and we were preaching their revelation. And for a week or two, things would go good. And then after I got criticized, this is still when I was in a Baptist church and I was told that I was of the devil and you can't preach this stuff. And the pastor would come sit and listen to what I'm saying and sit there and try and intimidate me into not preaching anything that didn't square with the Baptist theology. And after a few weeks of that, I'd still be saying the same things, but it was just lifeless. And it happened so often that I knew it was going to happen. I knew that for a week or so things would be good and then it had just ceased to be good and I couldn't figure out why. And the Lord spoke this to me and he says, it's because you don't have root in yourself. And when affliction and persecution come, you lose your commitment to it. Now, I didn't lose my intellectual knowledge of it. If you were to ask me, I'd still say, but I wasn't excited about it, bold about it because I didn't have root in myself. And man, this changed my life when I saw this and I made a decision that I'm not going to quote other people. I'm not saying I don't listen to other people, but I'll listen to them until, and then I'll take that to God and I'll let God speak it to me and it'll become rooted on the inside of me. Yeah, I don't know if any of you have listened to me much, but if you've listened to me, I very seldom quote other people and it's not because I don't respect other people or, or receive what they say, but I just learned decades ago not to preach another man's revelation. I hear it and then it becomes my revelation and God spoke it to me and it's mine. And this is the way you've got to be. And there's a lot of people that are just, you, you hear somebody preach it and so you go say in the name of Jesus and the devil says, Jesus, I know, and Andrew, I know, but who are you? You don't have the word rooted on the inside of you and you have to make the word personal and it takes time to get root. Man, I've got so many examples on this. Like I said, I could preach on this for hours. I want to just hit this and go on, but this is where most people miss it. They do not take time. Roots go at least twice, sometimes three and four times as deep below the ground as the plant is above the ground. Most people are wanting the growth above the ground. They're wanting to see prosperity, healing, victory, joy, peace, flowing in the Holy Spirit, all of these things. They're looking for this growth and yet they got a root that deep. I was in Vietnam and it's a very long story, but man, I remember this day. It was a major turning point in my life and I was elected to be bunker guard while everybody else went through the gas chamber. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I'd prayed for that. And I was just laying on my bunker guarding everybody's stuff. And I was reading this exact passage of scripture. And in this same chapter, look down here in verse 30. This is Mark chapter four, verse 30. Here's another parable about the seed. It says, where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth forth great branches so that the fowls of the air may come and lodge under the shadow of it. This is talking about growth that you may have the very smallest. A mustard seed is tiny. You may have the smallest, you may feel the most insignificant, but the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and it grows and becomes the biggest of all of the herbs. And I was laying there reading this passage and I thought, God, that's what I want to be. I want to have growth so that I could touch other people, so that the fowls of the air could come land in my branches, so that I could give shade to people, so that I could impact lots of people. And I was praying for that. And the Lord spoke to me and he says, you know, your root is about that deep. And if I gave you all of this growth and if you became this huge tree, the first bird to land in a branch, the whole thing would fall over. It says the first puff of wind that came, you would fall over and you'd be dead. 
He says, it's because I love you that I haven't given you the growth. You got to get the growth below the surface. You got to get the seed rooted in you. And he says, if you would just take care of getting the word in you and let it take root, then I can guarantee you that the rest of it will grow. And it gave me direction for the rest of my life. And I have since then not prayed for growth. I've prayed God help me to get the word in my heart and I take it. And if you ever let the word root in your heart, I guarantee you it will produce the things that you need. I use this example when I was receiving an offering earlier this week. But you know, when you plant an apple seed, you don't ever see that apple seed groaning, travailing. You'll never hear it scream. You'll never see the tree shake and then go, ah, and here's an apple. It's just the nature of a seed to produce if you put it in the ground. And if you put God's word in and de- meditate in it day and night and day and night and sleep and rise night and day and it'll just work. It's the nature of the word to change you. It's the nature of the word of God to produce healing in your body, to produce joy in you, to give you a different outlook, to cause you to flow in the anointing of God. Anything that you need in your life will come out of this. This is a seed. But in the same way as you would think a woman is absolutely crazy if she was praying for children and wanted children and she never had a physical relationship with a man, you'd think this is crazy. There was only one virgin birth. You aren't going to be the second one. (laughs) If we saw a person go out and lay on their ground and pray over their ground and fertilize the ground and water the ground, but if they never planted a seed, we'd think that person's crazy. And yet we see Christians all of the time begging God to heal me. Oh, God, prosper me. Oh, God, move in my life. Oh, God, heal my marriage. And if you came and said, well, what scripture are you standing on? What seed have you planted? They say, uh, see, what are you talking about? Do you have a promise? Oh, well, I've heard that. I can't remember if it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, but uh, somewhere, doesn't it say by his stripes we were healed? Something like that. And you wonder why you aren't healed? You couldn't even find the scripture if you needed to. You have to have more intercourse with the word than that. You have to have the word become alive to you. And you've got to know what the word says. And yet there are vast numbers of people right here in this room that you are desiring God to do something. And right now, if I was to say, what scripture promises you what you're believing for? What seed have you planted in your life? You couldn't tell me a scripture. And you wonder why you aren't receiving. That's as crazy as a woman who wants children and will not have a physical relationship. That's as crazy as a person who wants crops and they will not plant a seed. And it's amazing. People will go to great effort. They will fast. They will get hundreds of people to agree with them. They will stay up all night long praying and wailing and begging and pleading and go through great effort when all you had to do is just plant a seed, amen, and give it some time and it would just automatically change you. Boy, that is powerful. If, If we really believe this, we have millions and millions of seed, hundreds of seed for whatever your need is. If you really believed and understood what I was talking about, it's as simple as going to the Word, finding out what those seeds are, putting them in your heart, meditating on it, speaking it, and you just give it time. And I guarantee you, you're going to be changed. It's it's that simple. And if you really believe this, there's no reason that in a year's time, two years' time, every person in here couldn't be hitting on all cylinders, walking in victory, seeing miracles happen. It's that simple. It is not based on anything. You know, one of the things that blessed me about this whole teaching was that I was a dropout of school. I never was the sharpest knife in the drawer. I've never been special about anything I've done. And and the way that I was raised, you had to have special charisma. You had to be an outgoing personality. You had to be, I don't know, you, you had to be all the stuff that I wasn't. And I was just feeling like, God, how could you ever use me? And when the Lord showed me this parable, I realized it's the seed that produces the fruit, not the ground. The seed's what's got the life in it. All you got to do is just get the seed in you and don't let anything steal it from you. And as I'll go through this parable, you'll see it's not the ground that had more that produced the most fruit. It was the ground that had less. 
less rocks, less thorns, less weeds. And I thought, God, if, if being less is what causes you to use us more, I can be less. I'm not sure I can be more, but I could be less. <laughs> Amen. I may not be able to have the charisma of somebody else, but I guarantee you, I can devote myself to the word of God. I can learn the word of God. I can put the time into it. And man, I have just for 44 years saturated myself with the word of God and it has revolutionized my life. That's what this parable is teaching. The second type of person is a person who received the word, but they didn't take time for it to get rooted They wanted this big tree with zero root. And it's because God loves you that he doesn't give you that growth because you couldn't sustain it. When I was in the sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Williamson, I was in trouble and he put me on the front row for talking. So I was right next to his desk and he had this experiment where he put put two uh, terrariums that were identical Everything about them was identical. They were in the same spot. They got the same amount of sun, same temperature, same moisture. Everything was identical. But in one of those terrariums, he had nearly a foot of dirt. In the other one, he had like an inch of dirt. And he put a tomato seed in each one. And then he just went about his business, you know. And over the days and weeks, the one that was in an inch of dirt sprung up nearly immediately. It grew quick and it grew to like a foot tall and the other one hadn't even broken the ground yet. And that thing grew to a foot tall, but you know what? After about a foot, it started turning white. It turned completely white and shriveled up and died because it had no depth of earth. It had to put all of its growth into what was above the ground because it couldn't put down roots. So that it germinated, there was life, but it all went into above the ground and it died. That's very descriptive of a lot of Christians who the word of God does touch them. It does have an impact, but you didn't take time to get it rooted and you only endured for a time. And the moment that affliction and persecution come, you just waste away because you can't handle it because you didn't take time to get the root in you. That other one, it took two weeks or something, but finally that thing grew. We had to stake it. It produced tomatoes and all of these things. It takes longer to really bear fruit than it does to be just a flash in the pan. And there's very few people that will do that. You know, when you talk about Bible school, we have people all the time, but man, I I can't got two years to prepare. Preparation time is never wasted time. Putting roots down is never wasted. If you knew that you only had three years before Jesus came back, you'd be better off to come to Bible school for two and spend one year doing what God calls you to do. You'd be more productive. Getting rooted in the Word of God is the most important thing that you can do. It will transform your life is what this is saying. Notice it also says that when affliction and persecution come is when you fall away. You know what affliction and persecution is for? To get your attention off of the word and over here thinking about what people are saying, nursing your wounds and doing stuff like this. And afflictions and persecutions are designed by the devil to steal the word from you is what it says here in these verses. For those of you who think that God sends every problem into your life and that God controls everything, this ought to end that because affliction and persecution came against the word. Actually, if you understand it properly, if people are speaking against you, it's a compliment. Now, you can be spoken against because you're just a mess, but you can also be spoken against if you are taking a stand for the word. If you stand for the word, you will have opposition. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The only people in here who are not persecuted are ungodly people. If you're godly, you will be persecuted. Somebody will say something against you. If you swim upstream, it takes more effort. There is more resistance than to float. You know, a dead fish could float downstream, and this is what a lot of people do. Nobody criticizes them because they don't ever take a stand for anything. The Word of God doesn't mean anything to you. But if you take a stand for the Word of God, people will persecute you. 
Man, I've got so many things I could say about that, but I'm going to go on in the name of Jesus. You need to get that teaching on this. It would change your life. The next verse, verse 18, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You know, when the Lord first showed this to me, I was in the stage of where people were criticizing me and because I wasn't grounded in the word, I would get offended and lose it. And I made a decision that I was going to stand in the word and I didn't care what anybody said. If it cost me every friend I had, if it cost me whatever, I'd never back down on the word again. And it was a process, but I began to do that and I moved past that stage. And then I came into this stage where the word was working but cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things begin to choke the word. And, and this is where a huge segment of the body of Christ lives. They know the word. They've taken a stand to the degree that it's beginning to be rooted. They've suffered affliction and they're still standing. They're still operating in the word. But then they just get caught up with the cares of this life. We just get busy. Did you know the ministry is not sin. The ministry is good. God has blessed us, but we have so much going on. I got on my computer this afternoon and had 93 emails I needed to answer. You know, if you aren't careful, the ministry could choke the word. It doesn't have to be sin. It doesn't have to be X-rated stuff. You can just get so busy that you don't have time for the things of God. And this is where a large segment of people live. They don't prioritize and they allow all this other stuff. We get into things. You know, I'm not against anybody. Don't get me wrong. Don't take this personal. But man, I hadn't got time for Facebook and Twitter to be on there telling somebody, I'm now walking into the living room. I'm now going to drink some tea. I'm going to sit down. Man, if you're doing stuff like that, get a life. That stuff will choke the word in your life. Now, it's okay if you want to meet friends and keep up with people you haven't known since high school. I'm sure that there's some good to it, but I'm just saying some people, the way that I, I can't go anywhere without seeing, I mean, if there is a second, boom, they start pulling that thing out and texting. And I think, what did you do before you had all of this stuff? Did you talk to somebody 24 hours a day? Did you always have to be talking to somebody? The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46, 10. You know what? You need some downtime. You need some time where you're free to meditate in the word and do things. We have a lifestyle that if you will allow it, it will consume every waking moment. I have people all the time, if you ask them, how are you? They'll say something about, oh, I'm busier than a one-armed paper hanger. It's something about how busy you are. You know what? You could free up hours a day if you change some of your social media and some of your television watching and stuff like this. And you need to spend that time in the Word of God. If you don't, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things will choke the Word. The principle is that the ground only has so much nourishment in it. And if you want that tomato to grow, then you're going to have to pull the weeds and get rid of everything else or those other plants will take the moisture and the nourishment that could have gone to the tomato plant and it won't produce. And this is what's happening. You've got a root system, but you're so occupied with everything else that you don't have time to spend in the Word of God. And because of it, you just don't bring any fruit to perfection is the way it says this over in the book of Luke when it gives this same story. In other words, there was fruit, but it just never matured. It was little tiny. It didn't grow because it didn't have the nourishment. All of the other stuff choked it. And there's so many Christians that this is where they live. They don't give the Word of God the priority. They allow everything else to come in and choke the Word of God in your life. Amen or oh me. And if you last through those first three things, if you begin to get an understanding... You renew your mind. Then you let the word take root. You take the time and you stand against persecution and criticism and you still stand for the word and you don't back down. And then you keep focused and you, you don't let other things distract you, but you keep your priority on the word of God. Then you come to the fourth type of ground, 
where it bears fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. And it was because that ground had less, less rocks, less thorns, less weeds, less problems. It's typical of a person whose heart is set on the word of God. And even among those who go ahead and bear fruit, they're still varying degrees, not because God ordained it. He said in Mark chapter 10, I believe it's around verse 30, that you will receive a hundred fold in this life. And God wants the potential. He, it says over in uh, John chapter 15, I forget what verse, around verse six or something. Herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. God's will is for you to bear much fruit. He didn't want anybody to just be a 30 fold. Now he loves you if that's where you are, but everybody had the potential of a hundred fold. But even among the people who lasted through all those other things, there's still varying degrees of growth because some people commit themselves to the word more than others. If everything I'm saying is true, which it is, then the proper response ought to be, God, nobody in this room is going to commit themselves to the word of God more than I am. I'm going to be more committed. I'll know the word of God. I'll let it take root. I'll spend more time in the word. Nobody is going to give it more place than I do. If you made that decision, I guarantee you, you'd become a hundredfold fruit bearer. That's the way it'd work. It's not the word that determines it. Some of you just think, but you don't understand. I'm not talented. Ta-da. I tell you what, God didn't, if I would have been God, I wouldn't have chosen me. I've never been special in anything I've done, but you know what? I took the word of God and I've seen it raise my son from the dead. I've seen it raise multiple people from the dead. I've seen all of these miracles. I've seen God do awesome things. I'm seeing God use me and it is not because I'm the sharpest knife in the drawer, but it's because I've committed myself to the word of God and the word of God will change your life. So I don't care who you are. And if you think you aren't talented and if you don't have the looks of somebody else and if you aren't polished, God gets glory. It says he delights in using the weak things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised and things that are nothing to bring to naught, things that are. If you feel like a failure, you qualify. There's nobody that this won't work for. It's the seed that produces. All the ground does is give the seed a place to stay and you keep the fowls of the air from digging it up. Man, that's awesome. I don't know if that helps you, but that just turned my life around when I saw this. I thought, God, I can do this. I can separate myself. And you know what? It'll cost you something. I don't know hardly anything that's gone on for the last 44 years. If it's not in the Bible, I don't know about it. Jamie and I went on a cruise. And you know, on this cruise, you have to sit with people that you don't know. And they had discussed things. I don't know anything but the Bible. <laughs> They'd go to talking about stuff. And I just sit, I just was like a bump on the log. One night they said, everybody tell what your favorite drink is. And somebody had named a Harvey Wallbanger, this and that. And they got around to me and I said, I've never taken a drink of liquor in my life. Well, what's your favorite beer? I've never tasted beer in my... And it just killed everything. Nobody said anything the rest of the night. What's your favorite book? The Bible. Well, outside of the Bible, I don't read anything but the Bible. You know, I can kill any conversation. Jamie's parents used to like to play Trivial Pursuit. And the guys would divide against the girls and we'd play. And I'd just sit there like a knot on a log because I've missed 44 years of American culture. I don't know sports. I don't know who won this. I don't know actors. I don't know movies. I don't know anything. I just sit there. And so I determined, I said, I'm going to get this next question. I started believing God for a word of knowledge. And I was praying and asking God to tell me this next question. And so the question came up, what magazine debuted April the 1st, 1953? And God gave me a word of knowledge. And I, the only question I answered all night long was Playboy magazine. It debuted. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, sure, all you've been doing is reading the Bible. But I told them, I said, it was a word of knowledge, I tell you. <laughs> 
I'm not sure they ever believed it, but that's the only way I can answer questions. I've missed a lot of stuff. I've missed a lot of sickness and disease and sadness and grief. And I'd recommend it. If you're going to err, I'd recommend you err on the side of just meditating in the word day and night. Amen. Drop down to verse 26. Here's another parable that he taught this same day. And it says, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Verse 14 says, this is talking about the word of God. The word of God is like a seed. It's as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. Boy, that's a powerful passage. You don't have to understand this. I don't understand it exactly. I don't, you know, when you plant a seed in the ground, you could take all of the scientists of this world. You could pull the resources of every nation on the face of this earth and put trillions and trillions of dollars into research. And they cannot tell you why a seed works. They could create something that would look like a seed. They could take something that was had the same weight. It might even taste like a seed. But if you put a man-made seed in the ground, it won't grow. It won't sprout. They don't understand it. They can't make, they, nobody's figured it out. There's a miracle in a seed. They've taken seeds that were in the Pharaoh's tombs and were there for 4,000 years and they just laid dormant. And then you plant them and put them in ground and water them and those seeds spring and come to life. Nobody understands how that works. But that doesn't keep you from planting a seed and seeing a plant grow and eating the fruit of it. You don't have to understand this. You don't have to be, you don't have to figure it all out. Just do what the Word says. Take the Word and put it in your heart and protect it and meditate in it day and night. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein for then after you've meditated in it day and night, then shall you make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. Everybody wants to be prosperous and have good success, but they don't want to take the word and meditate in it day and night. They don't want to plant the seed. They want the harvest, but they don't want to plant the seed. Man, this is just simple. You just plant it and you sleep and rise night and day. You can't just plant it and then get up in the morning and dig it up to see what's happened. I don't know how this works. I don't think anybody understands it, but you, you can't plant a seed, dig it up and see what's happening and then replant it and then dig it up. And you can't do that. It'll never germinate. You have to put it in the ground and just leave it there. I don't know how it figures out when it's going to sprout. I don't know how it works, but it works if you'll leave it there and just have faith that I've planted this seed and it's going to work. If you're the kind that takes this message and you get all inspired and think, all right, I'm going to go home and I'm going to read an hour's worth of scripture tonight. And then in the morning, if you get up and you still have problems, you think you dig it up and say, well, it didn't work. It doesn't work that way. You're going to have to get this and you're going to have to meditate in it and just make a decision that the rest of my life, I'm going to take these truths. I'm going to take what the word says. I'm going to live in it and you just do it. And if it takes a week, it takes a week. If it takes a month, if it takes a year, if it takes five years, if it takes the rest of your life, you don't know how it's going to work. You don't know when it's going to work, but you believe that if I put this word in my heart, it's going to work. There's a bamboo plant that when you plant it, the, very, the first four years, it produces one leaf about that tall. Four years, that's all that bamboo plant does. And then in the fourth year, it grows 18 feet in one year. I figured that out, that under a six-month growing cycle, that would mean it would grow nearly a quarter of an inch an hour. It's growing nearly fast enough that you could see it grow. And people think, man, that thing grew 18 feet in six months. No, it grew 18 feet in four years and six months. It was growing roots below the ground. And they just left it there. And it was working the whole time. And then you see this result. I had one of my Bible college students come to me one time after I ministered. And they were just really blessed. And they said, that was awesome. How long did it take you to prepare that message? And I said, 33 years. And they said, no, I mean, how long did you study for that? And I said, 33 years. You don't, 
you may listen to me for an hour and think, man, I wonder how long he studied on this. Now it's been 44 years. You've got to take the word and just put it in there and sleep and rise night and day and not dig it up and have faith that this word's going to work. My healing's coming. My prosperity is coming. My joy is coming. My revelation is coming. This word will produce in me. I will not give up on this. And if you would do that and mix the word with faith, Hebrews chapter four, verse two says, the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You got to mix the word with faith. If there isn't faith in the word, then you don't release the power that's in it. So you just sleep and rise night and day and the earth, the seed should bring forth, uh, should spring and grow. He knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. The earth here is talking about your heart. Your heart is made by God that whatever you plant in it grows. Not only the word, but you know what? You plant fear in your heart. It'll grow. Your heart will make whatever you think on, whatever you focus on will grow. If you watch lust and adultery and murder and sexual things, you know what? Sexual stuff will grow in your heart. You meditate on fear, fear will grow. You meditate on anger, anger will grow. You meditate on anything and it'll grow. And if you meditate on the word, the word will grow. Your heart is made to take your thoughts and nurture them and bring them to life and spring. So therefore it is super important that you protect your heart and only let godly stuff into your heart because whatever enters into your heart will grow. The earth just brings forth fruit of itself. It's the way God made the earth. You put, you know, the earth doesn't matter if you plant corn or potatoes or it doesn't matter. The earth just grows stuff. It doesn't matter what seeds you put in it. Now some ground will grow better in some seeds will grow better in some, but the ground doesn't care what kind of seeds there. It'll make whatever you plant grow. Same thing with your heart. Man, that is a sobering thought right there. And hence, that's the reason that so many of us have weeds and thorns and ca the cares of this life that's choking the word because we allow a lot of stuff to come into our heart that we should never have. You know, if you were to keep reading in Ephesians chapter four, where I started this series, it says, it's a shame to even speak of the things that the ungodly do in secret. Not only do we speak of it, we portray it on the movies. We watch it for entertainment. You watch stuff that your grandparents would have thought was uh, pornography. They would have spanked your bottom for watching the stuff that you watch. And that stuff takes root. And people wonder why they struggle with this stuff. Man, this is powerful. And then it says in verse 28, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. This shows you that there's growth, there's stages. First the ear, then the, uh, first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. There's growth. The word of God will never produce instant results. There's growth. And a person who isn't patient and is just, you're going to try this and by tomorrow, if you don't have your answer, you're quitting. And it proves that Andrew missed it and this stuff isn't real. Word won't work for you. There's going to be steps and stages. First the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. I had one of my Bible college students come to me who was, uh, he had been in mental institutions his whole life. He was about 40 years old and he got a government grant to come to Bible school and the guy was born again. He was a nice guy. I really liked him. I just wanted to take him under my wing and I was going to try and help this guy to become a normal human being. And I started teaching him out of the book of Proverbs. I started telling him about how God wanted him to prosper. And anyway, within a short period of time, this guy came to me and there was a uh, hotel in Manitou Springs that was built in the 1800s. It was stone. And it had 110 rooms in it and it had a fire and it was just laying there derelict. It was just the shell and the thing was, was all messed up. And anyway, he found out that you could buy that thing for $2 million 
and it was going to cost $3 million or something like that to, to renovate. He went and did a lot of stuff and found out how much money he'd have to spend, how much money the whole project would be. He broke it out into monthly payments, figured out how much uh, income could come in if he rented that out to Bible college students. And on paper, he could have had enough revenue coming in to pay for this project. And he thought that was just great. And he came and presented this to me and was so proud of it. And he says, this is what God has told me to do. I'm going to buy this derelict hotel and fix it up. It's going to be a $5 million project. And I'm going to do this. What do you think of it? And I told him, I said, it's not God. And he just looked at me like, why would you say that? And I said, Jerry, you have never worked a day in your life. You have never made a dollar in your life. And you're going to go out and jump from nothing to a $5 million project and manage this and do it? I said, that's never God. Never God. God doesn't do things like that. I said, now the fact that you're dreaming is good, but take a smaller project and go get a job first and get a paycheck and make and, and start moving and get out of your parents' house and move in by yourself and start working a job and managing your budget and do a blade first and then the ear and then the full corn in the ear. But you can't go from zero to a thousand all at once. That's not acceleration. That's a wreck. And I know some of you are probably thinking, well, you dashed that boy's hopes. But I can guarantee you he would have failed. You do not go from never having ministered to anybody to pastor in a thousand member church. You can't do that. It'll destroy you. It'll kill you. You don't ever go from never having prayed from anybody to having a healing ministry. You don't ever go from never having taught a Bible study until you're going to be having some worldwide ministry and doing stuff. There's always steps and stages. The Word of God, just like a plant, will produce a little bit and it'll grow. And unless you're willing to have growth, then you'll never see the Word of God work in your life. And this is where a lot of Christians disconnect because they just want a miracle. They've seen it on television. And you come and you wave your hand over me and I just walk out whole and I didn't have to study the Word. I didn't have to get the Word rooted in my life. I don't have to quit watching as the stomach turns on the television. I don't have to commit myself to God. I don't have to resist anything. I don't have to get persecuted for the Word of God. You just pray over me. That's where most Christians are. And I'm telling you, the Word won't get you healed. Now, you can get healed by a miracle but miracles are few and far between. You can't grab a handle on it. You can't control those. You also can't find people that have the gift of miracles every day, and you're going to have to run from meeting to meeting and hope that you get up in the line before the time's over, and that's an ineffective way of doing it. But you can take the Word, and if you would take the Word and plant it in your heart and give it time, it will produce little by little, and you would see whatever it is that you need come to pass through the Word of God. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Well, I was wanting to get into verse 35, but you need to get my teaching on that. That, That's the summary of everything I was going to say, but I'm out of time. Man, that's awesome. I tell you what, God's word is so powerful. We don't realize how powerful this is. Many of you have multiple copies of the Bible and you keep it on your nightstand, on your table, and never open it. And I tell you, that's just, that's a waste. This word is absolutely powerless until you take it off of the page and put it in your heart and it starts releasing its life and germinating. There's a lot of people that use the Bible the way that they do in the vampire movies. If you've ever seen those, you know, a vampire will be coming against somebody and they'll hold a Bible up and the vampire just can't stand it and backs up. Or they hold a cross up. That's stupid. First of all, there aren't any vampires. But if there were vampires inspired by the devil, he wouldn't be afraid of the Bible. The devil's translated some of these Bibles. 
You said something on top of the Bible. And so I removed it real quick and you could see a dust ring where that <laughs> cup had sat. She honored the word. She never read it, but she honored it. And that's useless. You can mark in your Bible. You can stand on this Bible. You can tear pages out of the Bible. You haven't hurt the word. The word is living. It's alive. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the word is quick. That means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is alive and it's only when you take these words off of this page and put them on the inside of you that it releases any power. When the seed gets in the ground and is given the right nourishment, then the life comes out of it and it begins to grow and germinate. And it takes time. And if you will take this seed and put it in your heart and not let other things come in and choke it, not be put off because somebody's going to criticize you because you're a word person. And you'll stand for the word even if it's not popular. And you'll take time and you'll meditate in it. And you'll sleep and rise night and day and you just have faith. I don't know how it's going to work, when it's going to work, but God's Word will work. You do these things that we've talked about and I guarantee you, you would bear fruit a hundredfold. People would start coming to you because they would see the Word working in your life instead of you having to always run to somebody else and try and get help. You could start being a part of the answer instead of a part of the problem. Instead of the person who's always oppressed and always got a problem, you could be a person who's always blessed. I just read an email this afternoon of a woman who was in a business when I walked in and somebody said, how are you? And I said, I'm blessed. And they said, well, I'm highly favored. And we talked for a little bit. And after I left, they said, what was that all about? What is being blessed and highly favored? And they explained, and that woman got turned on to the Lord and has been on the website and she says, my life has changed ever since that situation. <laughs> Man, you can get to the place where you're blessed. You're the one that's helping others instead of having to always just drain the life out of everybody else because you are so carnal. Wouldn't you like to be one that could help other people? Wouldn't you like to get to where it's not, you're using your faith for just all of your problems and you're praying about all of this stuff. Wouldn't you like to get to where you could use your faith to help somebody else? This is how you do it. I tell you, this is so simple. It is so simple, but it is profound. And the hardest thing you'll ever do is get in the Word of God and stay there and never come out and never compromise it. The devil, he will let you do all kinds of things. He'll let you go to church. He'll even, there's a lot of churches he would draw you to because it would be detrimental to your growth. He'll let you do all kinds of good things. He'll substitute, he'll nearly do anything. He'll let you do anything but get in the word. When you make a decision that you're going to meditate in the word day and night, I guarantee you, you'll have all hell break loose against you. Satan will come against the word. He comes immediately for the word's sake to steal away the word that was sown in your heart. It says in Hebrews chapter uh, 10 that once you're enlightened, you endure a great fight of afflictions. That's talking about once the word of God starts germinating, the revelation is coming, you will have a slew of problems. And some people think, well, man, this doesn't sound positive. But you'll overcome them. I'm not saying that you will be beat by them. You'll overcome. But I can guarantee you Satan will test you. He will try and get you to back up. I had basically been healthy most of my life until I started preaching healing. And when I started preaching healing, I was sick for six months. And I couldn't figure this out. I thought, God, I've never really had a problem. But you know what? The moment you make a stand in some area, Satan's going to come against you. And he tried to get me to back off. And I finally had to come to a place where I don't care if I can live it or not. This is what the Word says, and I'll proclaim it whether I can see it working in my life or not. And I finally broke through a barrier, and then I started walking in health. 
You start preaching on anything, and I guarantee you Satan is going to continue and that contest you in that area, come against the Word, trying to get you to back up. But it's worth it. I would highly recommend it. And brothers and sisters, every one of us have the potential of producing a hundredfold. Every person in here, Jesus said, He that believes on me, the works that I do, will he do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go unto my Father. Every person in here has the potential of doing what Jesus did, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, healing the sick, operating in an anointing, drawing people to the Father. Every one of you have that potential. Not just a few of you. Every person in here has the same potential because it's not you, it's His Word that's going to bear the fruit. All you got to do is take the Word and protect it. Man, that, that's, that ought to excite you. I don't know how you're sitting there. That's exciting. Thank you, Jesus. You know, if I hadn't have made the decisions that I made and I heard this message, I'd be saying, God, look no further. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong in behalf of those who are perfect in his sight. I'd be saying, God, don't look any further. Here I am. God, I'm going to receive it. The Lord would pass over everybody in Florida to find one person in here who would commit himself and say, God, I'll take the word and I'll let it rule my life and I'll dominate my thinking and my emotions and everything by your word. He'd pass over everybody in Florida to get to you. He's looking. And you ought to say, look no further. Here I am. You can do it. But it's not just a one-time decision where you make it tonight. You're going to have to have, feel the same about this tomorrow and then the next day and then the next day and 20 years from now and 30 years from now if the Lord tarries. But if you would do that, brothers and sisters, this would change your life. I pray that I've created a hunger in you and, and shown you what the, word, what the potential of the Word of God is so that you'll never get over it and that you'll begin to start committing yourself to the Word of God and let the Word of God have its full impact in your life. If you'll do that, man, not only will you be changed, but we could change this area. If this many people... We have seven or 800 people in this auditorium, and I guarantee you if 700 people were to take the Word and meditate in it day and night in a few years, I guarantee you this area would be awash in revival. You would be so... You would see things happen, but the problem is we just have people that aren't filled with the Word of God. The Word of God's not controlling them. But it wouldn't take a bunch. This group right here could change Florida. You could change the politics. You could change everything. The economy would change. The crime rate would go down. Everything would change. Education would change. Everything would change. Man, I challenge you to take the Word of God and let this work. Father, I just pray for every person in here right now in the name of Jesus, and I've spoken these words. I pray that the Holy Spirit takes your Word. I've put seed out of my mouth. I've spoken seed into the ears of every person in this place. And Father, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help them get it below the surface, to get past the understanding and down deep into their heart that they would make a commitment that they are going to retain this Word. That they aren't going to let Satan steal it. That they are going to get rooted. That they are going to take the time in their closet by themselves without the crowds around to just be in the Word and meditating and letting the Word soak down on the... We receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save our souls. We receive these truths, Father, and we believe that you're never going to let us get over this, that you'll remind us of this. And people who are making a commitment right now to put your Word first, I believe that you'll hold them to it that you'll remind them tomorrow when they get back into their routine that they won't go back to the way it was before, but that they'll change. 
that, Father, they'll meditate in the Word. They'll do what they've got to do to keep your Word foremost in their life. And Father, we thank you. I believe that as we do this, this we're going to be transformed through the renewing of our mind and we will prove, make manifest to our physical senses what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just receive that and thank you for it. I praise you and believe there's going to be awesome results from these meetings, from the Word of God, from these seeds that have been sown. I thank you there's going to be mighty oaks grow up, tremendous growth. If you were to tarry, Father, that long after I'm gone, that these people would have had a seed planted that'll be growing and touching millions and thousands of people all around the world. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just receive it. Thank you for doing that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I tell you, I've given you a treasure tonight. Some of you may recognize it. Some of you may not. But I've given you a treasure. What you do with it's your responsibility. But I pray that you recognize how powerful the Word of God is. If you aren't born again, you need to be born again. That's the very first word that you ought to receive is you must be born again. You must be born from above. You can't save yourself. You need a Savior and you have a Savior, Jesus. You just need to confess Him as your Lord. If you've never done that, that's the very first word that you ought to act on. And then the Bible also says, he told his disciples who were already born again, he says, don't go anywhere. Don't tell anybody anything. They had the greatest news in the world, but he said, don't do anything until you receive the Holy Spirit. It's absolutely essential that you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. You cannot understand the Bible apart from the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You have to have the Holy Spirit explain this to you. You can't retain what I've said tonight unless the Holy Spirit brings it back to your remembrance. John 14.26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have spoken unto you. The Holy Spirit is what quickens everything to you. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a separate experience from salvation. And it includes many things, but it includes speaking in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will give you this ability to communicate past the unbelief and the doubt that's in your mind and talk directly out of your born-again spirit. When you start speaking in tongues, it causes revelation knowledge to just explode on the inside of you. So if you don't have that, if you don't speak in tongues, you need to receive it. We've had, I'm sure, how many? At least 200, three, 201. We've had over 200 people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit already. And if you don't speak in tongues, you need to receive that. Is there anybody here who would raise your hand and say, that's me, I want to receive this. Would you pray with me? If that's you, I want you to be bold and just raise your hand right now. And we'd like to pray with you. Here's a few here. Anybody else? Here's another one over here. Anybody else? We've already had hundreds, but praise God, I don't want to pass up anybody. Here's some over here. You know, if you raised your hand, or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, just get up out of your seat. Come right now and let us pray with you and we're going to help you to receive. Get out of your seat and come forward right now and let us pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This is great. You're never going to be the same. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Never the same again. 
You know, after the disciples received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, prior to that time, they ran and they hid. They denied that they even knew Jesus. But after they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were bold. They stood there and the, it says that they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. Man, the Holy Spirit will change you. It'll change everything. And I believe that this is what's happening in your life, that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come into you and transform your life. Amen? Before you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have to, first of all, be born again. Is there anybody up here that you aren't absolutely certain about whether you've been born again, whether Jesus is your Lord? Anybody? Here's one lady down here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Are you sure? I'm not trying to make you doubt, but there's a lot of people that just assume that they're saved because they're a good person and they think their good will outweigh their bad. That's not salvation. You're either 100% saved or you're 100% lost. There's no combination between the two. Here's another one down here that needs to pray. Here's another one. I knew that there was more. I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but you just got to be sure. And there's so many people that are just assuming. You can't assume. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You've got to make Jesus your Lord. That's more than just mouthing the words. You've got to literally turn your life over. It doesn't mean that you're saying I'll be perfect because you can't do that, but you're willing to let him have complete control and to the best of your ability, you're going to let him dominate you. You're, con you're making him your Lord. Anybody else besides these three? Anybody else? Here's another one. Anybody else? I'm going to lead the four of you in a prayer and I'm going to say words that you need to say. You don't have to say the exact words that I do, but you have to say something similar to this based on that scripture in Romans 10, 9. And I'm going to ask you to pray and repeat this after me. Okay, and if you will say this and mean it from your heart, I believe you'll be born again. Isn't that good? Jesus has already paid for your sins. It's not a matter of will he forgive you. He's already forgiven you. It's a matter of will you make him your Lord? Will you receive this? Y'all ready to do that? Let's, let's have everybody pray this after me so they won't just feel like we're listening to them. I want you to say, Father, Father. I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. I believe that you now live in me. I am forgiven. I am saved. Right now in Jesus' name. Amen. You believe that? <laughs> Welcome to the family. Amen. Welcome. I believe that y'all are born again. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. God bless you. So now, according to the Word of God, everybody up here has prayed this prayer, and the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's twice that it says that in 1 Corinthians. And the significance of that is, this is what He created you for. He created you to be a dwelling place for His Holy Spirit. So you don't have to wonder, will He give you the Holy Spirit? This is what you were made for. God wants you to have the Holy Spirit more than you want to have the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to wonder, will He do it? He wants you to have the Holy Spirit. So we aren't going to beg. We aren't going to plead. Some people teach that you got the Holy Spirit. Don't let any sense of unworthiness keep you from receiving tonight. Amen. So I'm just going to lead you in a simple prayer. We're going to open up the doors of this temple and welcome the Holy Spirit to come and take up residence on the inside of you. And then I'm going to ask our prayer ministers, if they would, to come up here and they're going to stand behind you and then they're going to lay hands on you because the Bible says that when you lay hands on people, the Holy Spirit was given. That's what the disciples did. So these are all people who've been filled with the Holy Spirit and after we pray, then they're going to lay hands on you and release this power of the Holy Spirit to come into your life. And after they lay hands on you, then I want you to quit asking God to give you the Holy Spirit. And I want you to thank Him that He did it. I don't care what you feel like. Some people are more concerned with what they feel than they are what God said. But God's Word says 
that if you being evil, Luke 11, 13, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It's a promise. He promised he would give you the Holy Spirit if you ask. So I don't care what you feel like, you got to believe that God gave you the Holy Spirit. So after they lay hands on you, I want you to just start thanking him that his word's true and that he did what he promised he'd do. Real simple. And at that time, after they've laid hands on you, I want you, when you start thanking God, to lift your hands like this. Because the Bible says, when you lift up your hands, you bless the Lord. This is a way of just, it's like when somebody sticks a gun in your back and you go, I surrender, I yield. This is your way of surrendering. God, I give up. I receive the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, it'll, it'll bless God and bless you. Amen. So that's what we're going to do. And then after you start thanking God, those people behind you are going to start praying in tongues. Everybody in here can pray in tongues with us if they have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to do this so that you won't feel like somebody's listening to you. And as we start praying in tongues, the Bible says when you pray in tongues, you're giving thanks unto God. So we're going to start thanking God for giving you the Holy Spirit. And I want you to quit thanking Him in English and just switch over to thanking Him in tongues. Amen. It's really simple. And I know you got a million questions. I had a bunch when I first uh, prayed and asked the Holy Spirit, but I've, I've got a book that will explain it in more detail. So I'm not going to spend all this time explaining it to you. But if you're ready, you could pray in tongues right now. You don't have to, but you get to. It's a blessing. I'm not praying in tongues right now. I'm talking in English because I can control it. The biggest problem that people make, they think, well, all right, they open their mouth and they wait on God to make them talk. And they think God's going to force you to speak in tongues, that he's going to take your mouth and make it talk. That's not how it works. I could speak in tongues right now. It's up to me. I'm choosing to speak in English, but I can speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit doesn't force you to speak in tongues. He inspires you to do it. It's just like when I spoke tonight, I believe God spoke through me tonight, but I thought of the words. I'm the one that said it. That's the reason it came out in Texan is because I talked. It was me talking. The Holy Spirit doesn't talk like me, but he inspired what I said and it came out through me. That's the way speaking in tongues is. It says in Acts 2, 4, that they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. The Holy Spirit inspires you, urges you to do it, but you talk in tongues. The Holy Spirit doesn't talk in tongues. He inspires you. So you have to make sounds. You have to do something and by faith believe it's the Holy Spirit. And after you get over the newness of it, and after you get over trying to listen to yourself and think, is this really the Holy Spirit? And you get your mind stayed on the Lord, you'll find it just flows out of you. And you can speak in different tongues and the Holy Spirit will confirm to you that it is Him inspiring it. And uh, it'll, it's very, very powerful. This book will explain it. But that's what we're going to do. And I believe that you're going to speak in tongues. Amen? Y'all agree? You look like, I don't know. Do you agree? The Bible says that believers will speak with new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer, I'm a believer. and I will speak, in tongues. I will speak in tongues. Father, I thank you for all of these. Thank you, Father, for these that prayed and made you their Lord tonight and that we have passed from death unto life and we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit that you created us to fill with your Holy Spirit. And so we want it. We open up the doors of our temple now. We open up the doors of our heart. Holy Spirit, come into us. Take up residence. We want your power. We want this gift of speaking in tongues and every other gift that you have to give. We want you and everything that you are. We need your power. So we open up our heart and ask you to come in Jesus' name. Now we lay hands on you in the name of Jesus and we release the power of the Holy Spirit. We say receive the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Boy, that's the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father, we loose this anointing to flow into these right now. Here's the anointing of God. Regardless of what you feel, He promised He'd come. I want you to lift your hands and start thanking God for giving you the Holy Spirit. Talk out loud. 
Say, thank you, Father, that I do receive the Holy Spirit. Thank you that I am God-possessed. Thank you that I have this gift of speaking in tongues. Thank you, Father, for this power now that's in my life. Those of you who know how to pray in tongues, let's just begin to worship the Lord and speak in tongues right now. And as we speak in tongues, you quit praying in English and pray in tongues. Start speaking right now. Start making sounds. You can't pray in tongues with your mouth closed. Don't shake your head. No, shake it. Yes, you got the power of the Holy Spirit. There's the anointing of God all over you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just pray in tongues. If you don't know what to say, you can try and say what you hear the person behind you say, but your tongue's going to be unique to you. It's not going to be the same as anybody else. You can't say what they say, but you could start trying to say it. And when it comes out different, just keep talking. Don't quit. Just keep speaking. Don't worry about what it sounds like. Don't worry about what it sounds like. When a little baby starts speaking in tongues, it doesn't sound like they're saying mama or daddy, but that mom and dad know what that baby's saying. Your heavenly father hears your heart. Doesn't matter what it sounds like. Just speak. Be bold. You can't talk in tongues with your mouth closed. Talk. Just speak out. Be bold. You're bypassing your brain. You're bypassing all the doubt and the fear and the confusion that's in your brain. And when you speak in tongues, you're pre, pr praying in your spirit. And you're releasing this, this power of God. It's, it's powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for this power. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. You can't speak in English in tongues at the same time. Don't speak in English. Speak in a language you don't understand. Thank you, Jesus. Man, many, many, many of these are praying in tongues. This is powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Let me have your attention here for just a minute. You know, I know many of you don't understand what happened and you're wondering about what is this all about? I've got a book that I wrote that will explain this. And let me also say that whether you spoke in tongues or not, I believe God gave you the Holy Spirit because he promised he would. So you've got, it's like when you get a pair of tennis shoes, they all come with tongues, amen. And I can guarantee you, if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you got this gift of speaking in tongues. You just have to learn how to use it. When I first asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I didn't speak in tongues for three years, but that's because I was a Baptist. And I had been taught that this was of the devil. And I had so much fear and worry about this that I just wouldn't allow it to work. And I kept persevering. I finally learned some things. I've written all of this in tongues after reading this book. So I'd like to give every one of you a book because this is more important than what you've understood. I don't care if you felt awesome tonight. It's bigger than what you think. If you felt nothing, it's bigger than what you think. And this is something you have to understand it. Like I was teaching tonight, if you don't understand it, Satan will come and steal away the word that was sown in your heart. So you've got to get understanding. And I've written a book about this that will help you. Plus we have people that will give you the book. And if you have any questions, you can ask them. And there's people that want to minister to you. We want you to get the full impact of what happened. This could be the most important thing that's ever happened in your life outside of being born again. Amen. So I'd like to ask you to go with Robert. He's standing right here in this aisle with his Bible up in the air. And if you would, just follow him for a moment. He'll give you a book. He'll pray with you and he'll help you to receive the full impact of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. That's awesome. 
So we had another 20 or more. So, you know, this is nearly double the amount that they first had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And look what they did. Man, I tell you, if these people would just get the fullness and respond to it, this could transform their lives. Amen. These are our prayer ministers down here, and I want to thank all of them. You know, most of these have just come and volunteered their time. And they've been down here early. They've stayed late. And they have prayed. And we have seen some awesome miracles happen. You guys have done a good job. Amen. And we appreciate it. And if you need prayer for anything, I'd like to ask you to come right now and let one of our prayer ministers just agree with you. You know, if you receive the word tonight, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Some of you, your faith has been quickened and this would be a great time for you to come and just get some agreement and mix your faith. And that word, that seed would begin to start germinating in your life. So we've got people standing at the aisles and they're going to direct you towards someone to get prayer. So uh, please cooperate with them. This is to keep everybody from just lining up on one side of the thing. But if you need prayer, just get up out of your seat and come forward right now. Let me remind the rest of you that all five of our sessions have already been duplicated on CD and DVD. They're out there and they're already available. We have all of our other teachings if you wanted to be a part of ambassadors to the nations and help them in Nicaragua, please take advantage of that. And if you need prayer, just come forward right now and let someone agree with you. The rest of you, thank you so much for coming and I commend you to the Word of God and to His grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the saints. Amen. God bless you. Go out and be fruitful. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we agree with all of these, and we just thank you that in the name of Jesus, that these people are healed, that Jesus has already borne their sickness, their disease. You said we could lay hands on the sick and that they would recover. And so, Father, we lay hands on them. We do what your word says. We pray a prayer of faith, and we believe that miracles are happening. And Father, deaf ears are open, blind eyes are open, tumors are gone, healings manifest themselves. Father, thank you for these miraculous things happening now in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Our prayer ministers are going to be down here to minister as long as you need them, but I'm going to go ahead and leave because my crew needs to start tearing everything down. And the longer I stay, the longer it takes.